Hi, and welcome back to our Jane Eyre read-along. Today we're going to do the first half of chapter 11. And if you remember where we left off yesterday, at the end of chapter 10, Jane was accepted into a new situation to be a governess at Thornfield Hall in the town of Millcote. And she was just getting ready to leave on her journey there. She did run into her old nurse, Bessie, who came to visit her at Lillwood before she left. And, um, you know, Bessie was impressed with all of Jane's accomplishments, like painting and speaking French and playing the piano, but she did comment that Jane wasn't all that attractive <laughs> or tall, you know, compared to the other Mrs. Streets. Uh, and Jane felt bad about that, but sort of moved on. So here at the chap beginning of chapter 11, she is at her destination. So let's see what happens. And thanks so much for joining me today. A new chapter in a novel is something like a scene in a play. And when I draw up the curtain this time, reader, you must fancy you see a room in the George Inn at Millcote, with such large figured papering on the walls as inn rooms have, such a carpet, such furniture, such ornaments on the mantelpiece, such prints, including a portrait of George III, and another of the Prince of Wales, and a representation of the death of Wolfe. All this is visible to you by the light of an oil lamp hanging from the ceiling, and by that of an excellent fire, near which I sit in my cloak and bonnet, my muff and umbrella lie on the table, and I am warming away the numbness and chill contracted by sixteen hours' exposure to the rawness of an October day. I left Lowton at four o'clock a.m., and the Millcote town clock is just now striking eight. Reader, though I look comfortably accommodated, I am not very tranquil in my mind. I thought when the coach stopped, here there would be someone to meet me. I looked anxiously round as I descended the wooden steps the boots placed for my convenience, expecting to hear my name pronounced, and to see some description of carriage waiting to convey me to Thornfield. Nothing of the sort was visible, and when I asked a waiter if anyone had been to inquire after a Miss Eyre, I was answered in the negative. So I had no resource but to request to be shown into a private room, and here I am waiting while all sorts of doubts and fears are troubling my thoughts. It is a very strange sensation to inexperienced youth to feel itself quite alone in the world, cut adrift from every connection, uncertain whether the port to which it is bound can be reached, and prevented by many impediments from returning to that it has quitted. The charm of adventure sweetens that sensation, the glow of pride warms it, but then the throb of fear disturbs it, and fear with me became predominant when half an hour elapsed and still I was alone. I bethought myself to ring the bell. Is there a place in this neighborhood called Thornfield? I asked of the waiter who answered the summons. Thornfield? I don't know, ma'am. I'll inquire at the bar. He vanished, but reappeared instantly. Is your name Eyre, miss? Yes. Person here waiting for you. I jumped up, took my muff and umbrella, and hastened into the inn passage. A man was standing by the open door, and in the lamp-lit street I dimly saw a one-horse conveyance. This will be your luggage, I suppose, said the man rather abruptly when he saw me, pointing to my trunk in the passage. Yes. He hoisted it on the vehicle, which was a sort of car, and then I got in. Before he shut me up, I asked him how far it was to Thornfield. A matter of six miles. How long shall we be before we get there? Happen an hour and a half. He fastened the car door, climbed to his own seat outside, and we set off. Our progress was leisurely, and gave me ample time to reflect. I was content to be at length so near the end of my journey and as I leaned back in the comfortable, though not elegant, conveyance, I meditated much at my ease. I suppose, thought I, judging from the plainness of the servant in carriage, Mrs. Fairfax is not a very dashing person. So much the better. I never lived amongst fine people but once, and I was very miserable with them. I wonder if she lives alone except this little girl. If so, and if she is in any degree amiable, I shall surely be able to get on with her. I will do my best. It is a pity that doings one best does not always answer. At Lowood, indeed, I took that resolution, kept it, and succeeded in pleasing. But with Mrs. Reed, I remember my best was always spurned with scorn. 
I pray God Mrs. Fairfax may not turn out a second Mrs. Reed, but if she does, I am not bound to stay with her. Let the worst come to the worst, I can advertise again. How far are we on our road now, I wonder? I let down the window and looked out. Millcoat was behind us, judging by the number of its lights, it seemed a place of considerable magnitude, much larger than Lowton. We were now, as far as I could see, on a sort of common, but there were houses scattered all over the district. I felt we were in a different region to Lowood, more populous, less picturesque, more stirring, less romantic. The roads were heavy, the night misty. My conductor let his horse walk all the way, and the hour and a half extended, I verily believe, to two hours. At last he turned in his seat and said, We're known so far from Thornfield now. Again I looked out. We were passing a church. I saw its low, broad tower against the sky, and its bell was tolling a quarter. I saw a narrow galaxy of lights, too, on a hillside, marking a village or hamlet. About ten minutes after, the driver got down and opened a pair of gates. We passed through, and they clashed two behind us. We now slowly ascended a drive and came upon the long front of a house. Candlelight gleamed from one curtained bow window. All the rest were dark. The car stopped at the front door. It was opened by a maidservant. I alighted and went in. Will you walk this way, ma'am? said the girl, and I followed her across a square hall with high doors all round. She ushered me into her room whose double illumination of fire and candle at first dazzled me, contrasting as it did with the darkness to which my eyes had been for two hours inured. When I could see, however, a cozy and agreeable picture presented itself to view. A snug small room, a round table by a cheerful fire, an armchair, high-backed, and old-fashioned, wherein sat the neatest imaginable little elderly lady in widow's cap, black silk gown, and snowy muslin apron, exactly like what I had fancied Mrs. Fairfax, only less stately and milder looking. She was occupied in knitting, a large cat set demurely at her feet. Nothing in short was wanting to complete the beau ideal of domestic comfort. A more reassuring introduction for a new governess could scarcely be conceived. There was no grandeur to overwhelm, no stateliness to embarrass, and then, as I entered, the old lady got up and promptly and kindly came forward to meet me. How do you do, my dear? I'm afraid you had a tedious ride. John drives so slowly. You must be cold. Come to the fire. Mrs. Fairfax, sit down. She conducted me to her own chair, and then began to remove my shawl and untie my bonnet strings. I begged she would not give herself so much trouble. Oh, it's no trouble. I dare say your own hands are almost numbed with cold. Leah, make a little hot negus and a cut sandwich or two. Here are the keys to the storeroom. And she produced from her pocket a most housewifely bunch of keys, and delivered them to the servant. Now then, draw nearer to the fire, she continued. You've brought your luggage with you, haven't you, my dear? Yes, ma'am. I'll see it carried to your room, she said, and bustled out. She treats me like a visitor, thought I. I little expected such a reception. I anticipated only coldness and stiffness. This is not like what I have heard of the treatment of governesses, but I must not exult too soon. She returned, with her own hands cleared her knitting apparatus and a book or two from the table to make room for the tray which Leah now brought, and then herself handed me the refreshments. I felt rather confused at being the object of more attention than I had ever before received, and that too, shown by my employer and superior. But as she did not herself seem to consider she was doing anything out of her place, I thought it better to take her civilities quietly. Shall I have the pleasure of seeing Miss Fairfax tonight? I asked, when I had partaken of what she offered me. What did you say, my dear? I am a little deaf, returned the good lady, approaching her ear to my mouth. I repeated the question more distinctly. Miss Fairfax? Oh, you mean Miss Varens. Varens is the name of your future pu pupil. Indeed. Then she is not your daughter? No, I have no family. I should have followed up my first inquiry by asking in what way Miss Varens was connected with her. 
but I recollected it was not polite to ask too many questions. Besides, I was sure to hear in time. I am so glad, she continued, as she sat down opposite me and took the cat on her knee. I am so glad you are come. It will be quite pleasant living here now with a companion. To be sure, it is pleasant at any time, for Thornfield is a fine old hall, rather neglected of late years, perhaps, but still it is a respectable place. Yet, you know, in winter time, one feels dreary quite alone in the best quarters. I say alone, Leah is a nice girl to be sure, and John and his wife are very decent people, but then you see they are only servants, and one can't converse with them on the terms of equality. One must keep them at due distance, for fear of losing one's authority. I'm sure last winter it was a very severe one, if you recollect, and when it didn't snow, it rained and blew. Not a creature but the butcher and postman came to the house, from November till February. I really got quite melancholy with sitting night after night alone. I had Leah in to read to me sometimes, but I don't think the poor girl liked the task much. She felt it confining. In spring and summer, one got on better. Sunshine and long days make such a difference. And then, just at the commencement of this autumn, little Adela Varens came and her nurse. A child makes a house alive all at once. And now you are here, I shall be quite gay. My heart really warmed to the worthy lady as I heard her talk, and I drew my chair a little nearer to her and expressed my sincere wish that she might find my com company as agreeable as she anticipated. But I'll not keep you sitting up late tonight, said she. It is on the stroke of twelve now, and you have been traveling all day. You must feel tired. If you've got your feet well warmed, I'll show you to your bedroom. I've had the room next to mine prepared for you, it is only a small apartment, but I thought you would like it better than one of the large front chambers. To be sure, they have finer furniture, but they are so dreary and solitary, I never sleep in them myself. I thanked her for her considerate choice, and as I really felt fatigued with my long journey, expressed my readiness to retire. She took her candle, and I followed her from the room. First, she went to see if the hall door was fastened. Having taken the key from the lock, she led the way upstairs. The steps and banisters were of oak. The staircase window was high and latticed. Both it and the long gallery into which the bedroom doors opened looked as if they belonged to a church rather than a house. A very chill and vault-like air pervaded the stairs and gallery, suggesting cheerless ideas of space and solitude. And I was glad. When finally ushered into my chamber, to find it of small dimensions and furnished in ordinary modern style. When Mrs. Fairfax had bidden me a kind good night, and I had fastened my door, gazed leisurely round, and in some measure effaced the eerie impression made by that wide hall, that dark and spacious staircase, and that long cold gallery, by the livelier aspect of my little room, I remembered that, after a day of bodily fatigue and mental anxiety, I was now at last in a safe haven. The impulse of gratitude swelled my heart, and I knelt down at the bedside and offered up thanks where thanks were due, not forgetting, ere I rose, to implore aid on my farther path and the power of meriting the kindness which seemed so frankly offered me before it was earned. My couch had no thorns in it that night, my solitary room no fears. At once weary and content, I slept soon and soundly. When I awoke, it was broad day. The chamber looked such a bright little place to me as the sun shone in between the gay blue chintz window curtains, showing papered walls and a carpeted floor, so unlike the bare planks and stained plaster of low wood that my spirits rose at the view. Externals have a great effect on the young. I thought that a fairer era of life was beginning for me, one that was to have its flowers and pleasures, as well as its thorns and toils. My faculties, roused by the change of scene, the new field offered to hope, seemed all astir. I cannot precisely define what they expected, but it was something pleasant, not perhaps that day or that month, but at an indefinite future period. I rose. I dressed myself with care, obliged to be plain, for I had no article of attire that was not made with extreme simplicity. I was still by nature solicitous to be neat. It was not my habit to be disregardful of appearance or careless of the impression I made. On the contrary, 
I ever wished to look as well as I could, and to please as much as my want of beauty would permit. I sometimes regretted that I was not handsomer. I sometimes wished to, wished to have rosy cheeks, a straight nose, and a small cherry mouth. I desired to be tall, stately, and finely developed in figure. I felt it a misfortune that I was so little, so pale, and had features so irregular and so marked. And why had I these aspirations and these regrets? It would be difficult to say. I could not then distinctly say it to myself, yet I had a reason, and a logical, natural reason too. However, when I had brushed my hair very smooth and put on my black frock, which, Quaker-like as it was, at least had the merit of fitting to a nicety, and adjusted my clean white tucker, I thought I should do respectably enough to appear before Mrs. Fairfax, and that my new pupil would not at least recoil from me with antipathy. Having opened my chamber window, and seen that I left all things straight and neat on the toilet table, I ventured forth. Traversing the long and matted gallery, I descended the slippery steps of oak. Then I gained the hall. I halted there a minute. I looked at some pictures on the walls. One, I remember, represented a grim man and a curious, and one, a lady with powdered hair and a pearl necklace. At a bronze lamp pendant from the ceiling, and a great clock whose case was of oak curiously carved and ebon black with time and rubbing. Everything appeared very stately and opposing to me, but then I was so little accustomed to grandeur. The hall door, which was half of glass, stood open. I stepped over the threshold. It was a fine autumn morning. The early sun shone serenely on embrowned groves and still green fields. Advancing onto the lawn, I looked up and surveyed the front of the mansion. It was three stories high, of proportions not vast, though considerable, a gentleman's manor house, not a nobleman's seat. Battlements round the top gave it a picturesque look. Its gray front stood out well from the background of a rookery, whose cawing tenants were now on the wing. They flew over the lawn and grounds to alight in a great meadow, from which these were separated by a sunk fence, and where an array of mighty old thorn trees, strong, knotty, and broad as oaks, at once explained the etymology of the mansion's designation. Further off were hills, not so lofty as those round Lowood, nor so craggy, nor so like barriers of separation from the living world, but yet quiet and lonely hills enough, and seeming to embrace Thornfield with a seclusion I had not expected to find existent so near the stirring locality of Millcote. A little hamlet, whose roofs were blent with trees, straggled up the side of one of these hills. The church of the district stood nearer Thornfield. Its old tower top looked over a knoll between the house and gates. I was yet enjoying the calm prospect and pleasant fresh air, yet listening with delight to the cawing of the rooks and surveying the wide hoary front of the hall and thinking what a great place it was for one lonely little dame like Mrs. Fairfax to inhabit. When that lady appeared at the door, what out already, said she, I see you are an early riser. I went up to her and was received with an affable kiss and a shake of the hand. How do you like Thornfield? She asked. I told her I liked it very much. Yes, she said. It is a pretty place, but I fear it will be getting out of order unless Mr. Rochester should take it into his head to come and reside here permanently, or at least visit it rather oftener. Great houses and fine grounds require the presence of the proprietor. Mr. Rochester, I exclaimed. Who is he? The owner of Thornfield, she responded quietly. Did you not know he was called Rochester? Of course I did not. I had never heard of him before. But the old lady seemed to regard his existence as a universally understood fact, with which everybody must be acquainted by instinct. I thought, I continued... Thornfield belonged to you. To me? Bless you, child. What an idea to me. I am only the housekeeper, the manager. To be sure, I am distantly related to the Rochesters by the mother's side, or at least my husband was. He was a clergyman, incumbent of Hay, that little village yonder on the hill, and that church near the gates was his. The present Mr. Rochester's mother was a Fairfax, and second cousin to my husband, but I never presume on the connection. 
In fact, it is nothing to me. I consider myself quite in the light of an ordinary housekeeper. My employer is always civil, and I expect nothing more. So that is the first half of chapter 11. Jane's in her new home. She's got new faces. A lot of things are going to start happening. So I hope you'll continue tuning in to our read-along. Thanks so much for watching today, and stay safe.